Welcome to the British Library, currently home to the Breaking the News exhibition, which scrutinises five centuries of UK news from all kinds of angles right up to the present day. Thank you for joining us tonight. Well, this is the BBC on Auntie's 100th birthday. The BBC is, of course, now a global institution, but it acts almost as a repository or a reflection of 100 years of British history. But what does its future hold? Let's find out. Please submit your questions throughout uh, in the box below, right here on the platform. Um, and we do have a quite extraordinary wealth of expertise on the panel here. So don't be shy. Get your questions in early so we've got time to get round to all of them. Uh, you can also give feedback here on the platform. And very importantly, you can buy our speakers books. Highly recommended. Um, our dazzling panel will be led by your host, Jean Seaton. Jean is Professor of Media History at the University of Westminster. She's Director of the Orwell Foundation. And she's the author of Pinkos and Traitors, the BBC and the Nation, 1974 to 1987. Over to you, Jean. Hello and welcome. And what we've got, I just want to introduce you to the panel, all of whom have, as it were, lived experience uh, in and of the BBC over many years. Um, so we're, we're, we hope to have a really lively discussion and don't be shy about putting your questions in. And don't be shy about going to the exhibition, which is tremendously interesting and has extraordinary juxtapositions, actually. So the panel tonight has got Janelle Aldred, who worked for 13 years for ITN, ITV, the BBC. She's the deputy chair of women in journalism. And she's written a very interesting book, which was um, Communicate, Communication for Change, creating justice in a world of bias. And I think she's got a really unique capacity to understand the way in which communications and what we call the media come from somewhere and go from somewhere. Um, so we're very pleased to have Janelle here with all of her experience. Then we've got Mark Dummerser, who's currently chair of the Booker Prize Foundation. Uh, so, you know, all you thinky booky people, Mark is the man who's in charge of the books at the top of your Christmas present list uh, next year. Um, not shy, the Booker uh, Prize Foundation of a little bit of controversy here and there, up and down, very useful. But Mark worked for the BBC for 25 years. He worked all over the shop in broadcasting, in Newsnight, in, in news, and he was the controller of Radio 4, our dear, dear Radio 4, um, uh, uh, for, for, for a number of years. And then he became, in that brief moment when we had BBC trustees between 2015 and 2017, one of the people responsible for the future of the BBC. But Mark, and then he went on to St Peter's College, Oxford, but Mark um, has thought about broadcasting and has been involved in almost every aspect of it. So we're really grateful for him to come tonight. Then we've got David Hendy, um, who I have known for a very, very long time and was a colleague. David's got an extraordinary, he also worked for the BBC. He's, I think, got a very particular ear for that which is heard. He wrote an absolutely wonderful book um, on sound and listening, which is called Noise, but also a wonderful book on the BBC Radio 4. And most recently, um, a book called The BBC of People's History, which manages to deal with the hundred years going forward, really. And so we're really, we, we're going to use David's extraordinary knowledge as our kind of foundation stone. And then we've got Pat Young, who is the founder of Cardiff Productions, but he too has worked in and out, out and over and round and through everything that matters in broadcasting. He, he's a non-executive director of ITV Studios, he was previously chief creative officer of the BBC, responsible for the most vast number of people and the most vast amount of programmes. Um, and he's currently the chair of Cardiff University. Um, and Pat's, Pat kind of understands, I think, the whole range of what it is that public service broadcasting is. So we've got some great insights, I hope, for you 
to challenge this evening. And I, I wanted to really start with David. Um, it, you know, I wanted to ask David in a way to tell us how it is that this weird little organization, um, which, you know, Asa Briggs said, you know, the press barons would have strangled at birth if they'd have got it, if they'd have understood. And they'd go, they'd go on trying to strangle it, frankly. I mean, how, it, with your extraordinary view, and th how did this, this thing called the BBC develop its values, become a thing? Has it got a soul? I, mean, I think different people would give a different answer to that. But for me, <clears throat> the BBC emerges not as uh, a piece of technology, but as an idea, or rather it's a social purpose to which the technology of the time is put. So, I mean, my starting point is really in the immediate aftermath of the war. You've got plenty of people who are despairing. World War One. Then. World, World War One. One. World War One. The Great War. Uh, the BBC starts in 1922, only four years after the end of the Great War, and there are plenty of people who are despairing of civilization, its ability to stop sliding constantly into into barbarism, and there are other people who believe that the time is right to to create a new and better world, if you like, who who are looking for a way of healing humanity, of increasing mutual understanding, of, of helping humanity to achieve its better self. And I think that's the reason why I start the history with looking at the three figures there in 1922, who in one sense embody this idea, these values. Um, you've got John Reith, deeply religious upbringing, believed he could serve God by serving the public, doing some good in the world, but he's not quite sure how or, or how it could be done. There's Cecil Lewis, um, who's only 24 when he becomes a kind of senior figure at the BBC. He was a teenage pilot in the war, exhilarated by the experience, but also despairing at the destruction that he witnessed. And after the war, he's wondering, could good art or poetry or music heal humanity in some way? But he's not quite sure how. And then you've got Arthur Burroughs, who's actually the only one of the three who really knows about radio or wireless as it was called at the time. And he'd been monitoring enemy wireless propaganda during the Great War. Uh, and he'd been appalled at the idea of how easily disinformation could spread, like a poison gas, he, he, he said. And he thought, well, if that's the case, then surely the same technology could be used to spread what he called a doctrine of common sense. And, and here was technology, radio, that had the potential to reach into every home, as he put it, from a palace to the humblest cottage. So their ideas kind of come together and they channel the spirit, which is still enduring, actually becomes more important after the war, of Matthew Arnold, that great Victorian writer who in Culture and Anarchy talks about how do we stabilize society? How do we uh, hold it together? It's going to be through culture or sweetness and light. As, as he called it. But the key for him was sweetness and light must prevail. It mustn't be just for the few. It wasn't gonna work unless it was for, for everyone. So in 1922, you've got radio is the technology to hand that makes this idea a reality to provide, to kind of paraphrase Reith and Burroughs and Lewis, to provide the best that has been thought and said and done to as many homes as possible. And, and that the second half of that sentence is just as important to the idea as the first half. Um, and that first half, the best, is not just about the kind of the elite stuff, the kind of it's also about, well, the best in entertainment and, and, and so on, because the complete life, as it were, the full life is not just one of virtue, it's one of pleasure and relaxation. Now, what counted as the best, clearly, <laughs> is something that had to be then argued over both outside the BBC and inside the BBC over the next hundred years. And, the, and of course, there's no sort of definitive answer. And there's also the question of technique. If the BBC had to be maybe a touch ahead of public opinion in the hope that it would nudge public opinion, public taste along with it, improve it steadily, a little bit of uplift, how could it, how far ahead could it be without losing the public from that chase, if you like. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of constant 
constant niggle, something that has to be worked out ad hoc in practice, bit by bit and in terms of programs. But behind that kind of constant argument, how do we do it? What is the best? And how do we deliver the best to as many people as possible? There is that enduring value that I think was articulated by William Haley, the, the wartime director general. He said, it's not about radio or television. It's about true citizenship and the leading of the full life. And that commitment to universal access, that attempt, not always successful, to offer the fullest range of ideas, culture, entertainment, and so on, to everyone equally. That's, I think, the core DNA that kind of everyone throughout that hundred years is trying to work through. Thank you very much. Um, can I just ask one, just, 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 just one sort of follow up on that? I mean, how difficult is it to find out what's the best and how, how do you balance what people want? I mean, I think that- with, 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 yeah. with what they may want. I mean, the, the BBC has sort of through its history found different ways of doing that. I mean, Cecil Lewis said, if there are, uh, in Savoy Hill, if there are about 12 of us gathered around the table, we all ask what we kind of think is the best, uh, what we think the public want. And then we err on slightly on the upper side of what, of what we judge the public to want. There is a, a slightly more a, a scientific way of doing it, which is to kind of think, gather data from the public. And even before the end of 1922, the BBC is getting something like 2000 letters a week. Uh, so it's, it's it, basically it's about sort of sniffing the air and sensing. Lionel Fielden, who's one of the other early figures in the BBC in the Savoy Hill days, um, it says that it, you know it's the producer's role to go to every party to speak to every politician to kind of to travel the 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 underground to speak to the public to just talk 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 to gather in a sense you, the idea is you have antennae um and i think that that one of the ways ways in which the bbc sometimes struggle is when they take some shortcuts and, and in a sense, audience research is a shortcut, which is very useful, but it maybe only tells you certain things. And perhaps in journalism, reading the kind of the British press for a sense of what is common sense or common opinion or whatever is also a shortcut that can <laughs> lead to some problems, I think. Um, so, so, you know, the, 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 the techniques for sort of sensing where public taste are, uh, are are always imperfect in some way. And if you kind of, if you immerse yourself in the kind of the records of the BBC, I mean, one of the, the one of the treasures of these records, the archives is the, is the records of the weekly program review board where senior figures chew over the output of the last week. And, and, they, and they, they pull together audience research and they pull together critical feedback uh, and, and the program correspondence, the letters and phone calls that have arrived but they also pull on their own professional instincts. And I suppose this is something that even Reef, in as early as 1924, he talks about this idea that, you know, if, if the right people are chosen, uh, who are the right people, but if the right people are chosen, they should develop an instinct, a sense. Grace Wyndham Goldie talks about this later on in BBC history, having the kind of sense for where to pitch the program and of course the, you don't always get it right and and the BBC is not straightforwardly responding to public taste mm. right it's it's you know the, the it, it follows and it leads it does both so it, it can't just identify public taste and then reflect that back that's it's doing something more and more complex than that that that's fantastic thank you very much I just we're we're bounding through a hundred years of, as it were, what it is to be British in a way. And I'd like to turn to Janelle next, or we can come back to some of the middle bits later, perhaps. Janelle, what, you know, th David's last words were, were a really good prompt for, I think, some of the things you'd like to say. How does the BBC have to get beside audiences? How does it, where is it? Where does it need to go now? How does it need to do it? 
I mean, if I think about some of the things that I talk about in my book, specifically around news and impartiality, and I think that's something that the BBC gets a lot of stick for at the moment is them not being impartial. But probably if some people are saying you're too far left and some people are saying you're too far right, you're probably around the middle and you're probably doing something quite right. But I think it's really interesting when we think about impartiality um, in terms of especially news and journalism. Because wherever there's people, there's bias. And some people might dismiss that as some kind of wokery chat. But I can definitely say that wherever there are humans, there is bias. And that is just a very natural, normal human way of being. And so when we think about and go through the history of the news, where there was, first of all, just the BBC, there was nothing to compare it to. So who was to say whether the BBC news was impartial or not, because there was no other alternative version or as Donald Trump calls them, alternative facts out there. But as we go forward into the now and where audiences are now, the great veil and magic of TV has really been lifted. We know how it's done. We know how it's made. We even know the people behind the news who make it. There would have been a time when you wouldn't have known anything like that, really, or anything about someone's political views or who they'd worked for previously before they came to the BBC. So in your mind was a view that the BBC is the truth, because there's no other truth really counteracting this truth. So when we think about what rolling news has done, and then let's add on to that social media. So when I first worked at the BBC, my very first job out of uni doing broadcast journalism, so I was very fortunate, but my very first job was putting the news, Midlands Today, on the internet. And at that time, there were no algorithms, there was no engagement, no one was counting. It was just about convincing journalists, one, to put their story on the internet before the six o'clock bulletin, which was very, very hard, and that was my job. And now we move forward to a time where you can't stop journalists from talking about their story before their stories even finished being cut and edited. So what that does to the audience is it gives them a multitude of viewpoints because it's not just the BBC now telling that story. Then you've got ITV, you've got Sky News, you've got Huffington Post, you have Vice, you have Galdem magazine, you have all these other people telling this very, very same story from a different perspective. So that lifts the veil in terms of people thinking there is an objective impartial, impartial truth around something that this one broadcast is telling us. So I think if we look into the future, what does this mean for the future of news? Because we all know if there's a big disaster, people will still turn to the BBC for that, what they believe to be a truth that they can lean on, that they can trust. But then at other times they will say, oh, you can't trust the BBC or you, you can't trust the news. You can't trust the media in that very general stereotyped term. So I think when we think about the future, we have to think about audiences as far more sophisticated than we've ever thought about them before. They're not just taking on face value what's been said to them. They're going somewhere else to look and check and it's saying something different. So now they're weighing that up with what they believe to be true. So sometimes when the BBC gets you know, a bashing for being biased, Sometimes it might be true, sometimes it might not be true. But in a world where perception for a lot of people has become reality, I think the BBC needs to take a bit more, in my opinion, of a thoughtful view. It's not good enough to say, but we're impartial because the people, they won't see that because we've seen where your director general, for instance, where he worked before, we know who we might vote for. And that sometimes people find it hard to separate a person's professional views from their personal views. And so I think there has to be that understanding that this is what is now going on in audiences' minds and taking that into consideration. That's brilliant. Can I just ask, just, just again, just one more question. There is an issue about actually how the news is made, which is rather different. And the BBC has one of the last big reporting operations left standing in the world. Nobody's worked out. So does that make a difference? I mean, it isn't just that it says it's impartial, that it's, but it does have people on front lines in a way that many organizations can't afford to anymore and I think that's true well, but don't I, want to. yeah but again it comes down to what audiences perceptions are because we know that because we are from there so we see all of that and then I think again sometimes what happens with organizations like the BBC there's an assumed knowledge that people know okay. that we're everywhere but the reality is audiences don't see it like that because for them Sky News are reporting on all the same stories as the BBC. So how do they not know that Sky are not also there, but just choosing to see it or say it in a different kind of a way? And so I think whilst a lot of the magic has been revealed or the, you know, the magic curtains have kind of disappeared, in a some sense, there's still the, the really back mechanics 
that people don't know about and it would be hard to explain in a way as well with the funding model and I think when you really start getting into some of that then people start really asking questions as well why are you funding all this and why are you paying for all that and why are you doing this so there's always that balance between how much information do people want how much they need it comes down to public interest what we're interested in is not always what's in our interest to know and so I think it comes down to all of these kind of subjects but I think one thing that I think the BBC could do to become a bit more reflective I think is to one really think about who are their senior leadership because now that is far more front-facing and known people want to see a bit more difference in their leadership to understand that there is impartiality there is true diversity of thought and enough difference of diversity of thought because yes if you get 12 white men in a room of course there's diversity of thought but there's not enough difference and so I think for people to understand the BBC is impartial they want to see that difference and see it kind of out there not front and center but to understand that it is there thank you very very much um which takes us seamlessly to mark uh Damasa, who's been in the middle of many a row um it has you know and the bbc is in one sense always under attack in another sense um does the is that true um and in another sense that attack does vary structurally actually and mark i can tell you mark's been in the middle of many a row so, and they're pretty nasty. BBC, there's nothing quite like a BBC conflagration, Mark, is there? That phone call on a Friday night at seven o'clock that says there's a problem with panorama. <laughs> uh, there goes your weekend, if not your life. Um, well, why is the BBC under attack? Um, I mean, if I could compress this into three words, um, because it matters or because it still matters. So if you just look at audience metrics, I think you could say that the power of the BBC uh, has diminished, uh, is diminishing, it will diminish further. Uh, that's uh, a function of technology and to some extent consumer choice and plurality, and that's all fine, but the numbers are still incredibly large. And instead of concentrating on the decline, one might want to think of where the BBC has declined from, where the figures were so astronomical they couldn't possibly be sustained in a world of technological and consumer choice. But the BBC still has a huge footprint. So 90% of, of people in the UK use it, including 80% of uh, people under the age of 35 who allegedly, if you take the worst reading of it, don't like the BBC, but that turns out not to be quite true, even though it's very challenging to sustain the degree of commitment from younger audiences. So it's a huge beast, and everybody knows that, and not only politicians, but audiences feel it and know it, and because they own it. Uh, it also has colossal brand power, if I can use, as it were, the modern idiom. It's been around for a very, very long time. It has a huge history and a huge mythology. And so it has status and heft, um, which gives it still more weight. So it's circular. Uh, audiences recognize that the BBC is a different sort of beast to what they might pick up on Twitter or YouTube or Instagram or TikTok or wherever else. Um, it is not the case. And by the way, this is true for some other aspects of mainstream media as well. It's not merely the BBC, but the BBC is the biggest player. It is not true that uh, the explosion in social media has devalued the currency of those broadcasters or newspapers who are trying to do something different and who do believe that fact-checking and fairness and impartiality really matter. Uh, and audiences therefore expect more from the BBC and they treat the BBC much more seriously. And if you look at the research that's been done for generations of Sun readers or Mail readers or Guardian readers for that matter, um, uh, and ask them what they expect of the BBC. Sun readers know perfectly well that the Sun and the BBC are very, very different media outfits, and they come to the BBC and receive the news from the BBC and programmes from the BBC in a different frame of mind to the way they pick up the Sun, um, which has its own virtues, but it's a different kind of beast. Um, why else? Because you can pressure the BBC. You can pressure the BBC for two reasons, one philosophical and one practical. The philosophical reason is that we all own it. Um, uh, and uh, gives it an ideological flavour, uh, a good ideological flavour, uh, which makes it very different to something which you can choose to buy and you don't feel that you have an equity stake in. The BBC 
uh, is a massive beast and it's also one that is differently constructed and has a different conception of its ownership. It's all of us who own it together. So that's one. Uh, and the second reason, of course, is much better known and it's more functional, which is that there are mechanisms, both the regulation and license fee funding, which make it a very obvious target for pressure. There are very strong antibodies. The BBC's own sense of its independence, the quality of its journalism, the connection with its audience, its relevance, its truthfulness, all of that provide the BBC with an array of weapons with which to fight back. But it's an irresistible target for uh, politicians because of these unique contextual reasons behind it. And then you have competition uh, around the rest of the media sector. So the BBC is a huge market intervention uh, there's no point apologizing for it or denying it. I mean, 3.7 billion pounds of public money is a lot of money per year. Uh, what would it be like without? Well, unlike America, um, the BBC existed when a lot of people were making investment decisions. So for newspaper owners to say now uh, the BBC has destroyed our profit margins uh, ignores the fact that when they made the decisions about whether to do this, that, or the other, whether it's online or work out a radio strategy or put more into foreign reporting or less into foreign reporting, they can't turn and say, uh, it's the BBC's fault. The BBC was there when they made these decisions. Yeah. It's perfectly possible that they would have made more money and would make more money if the BBC didn't exist, but the BBC does exist. And unless you believe in profit maximization in the private sector only, and we live in a mixed economy, then they have to live with it, but they don't like it because they can all see more or less that their bottom lines would be the greater without the BBC. Some uh, are able to manoeuvre and still make a lot of money and some approve of the BBC, even though it does affect their profit margins. But it means that the BBC is always likely to be the victim of those who not merely have an ideological prejudice, but also have a commercial interest in attacking the BBC. Uh, so finally, uh, I mean, what's unique now? Well, um, not everything. Um, there have been rows all the way back from the beginning, uh, and some of them are better known than others, but I've just been reading recently a reminder of the story around Harold Wilson, David Dimbleby, and yesterday's men, and I can tell you that was huge. And uh, go back to Suez and go back to the general strike and the attempt of the government in 1926 to try and influence the outcome. Uh, look at the row about J.B. Priestley during the war, it's from time immemorial. So people should not get the impression that it's unique and there's something absolutely iniquitous about what's going on at the moment. I don't think so. But there is a different shape to it. One is the opposition and the degree of technological choice and Netflix is now a new weapon with which to beat the BBC, in my view, completely absurd comparison between what the organizations do, but nevertheless, it gives the uh, friction a degree of different vocabulary and a different emphasis. Uh, and the other, and I think this is slightly new, I don't want to go too far with this, but there is an aspect of this, which is around the cultural wars, which changes a little the inflection of this debate. It's no longer really straightforwardly political or economic or industrial, um, uh, or, or even straightforwardly, underserved regions and devolution, there is something about the fractiousness of the debate about identity and culture, where the BBC is much the biggest player, is bound to feel the pressure. Uh, and you know the Conservative Party is tempted and very often can't resist the temptation to use this debate for tactical political advantage, which gives it a degree of extra both resonance and sometimes um, unpleasantness. Um, well, uh, just to say that uh, it will never stop. And the point at which it does stop is the point at which the BBC ceases to matter. Uh, and it matters. Thank you very, very much. Um, um, Swan, a really good chairman, once said that a nation on the rack puts the BBC on the rack over in Northern Ireland. And I think, you know, we're seeing that. Pat, um, could, what does, what does, you know, we, these, we've talked about news and those sort of high fluting things, but of course, in a way, all of those values have to live in programmes that people just enjoy. What, and those programmes have to be both the same, but also in a sense, have some other values, I think, if they're in a weird thing called public service broadcasting. What, what does the BBC mean for this weird thing we have called public service broadcasting? And what is it? What is what it? What is BSB? Um, well, if you take a step back, we have a PSB framework ecosystem, which is, I think, the envy of the world. 
and it's built on some very simple principles. We know that facts matter. We know that accountability matters. We know that identity matters. And it's how those values are transmitted, the core of our PSB ecosystem. Now, our PSB ecosystem is quite complex. It isn't just the BBC. It is the publicly owned BBC. It's Channel 4, it's S4C. It's also the commercial broadcasters, ITV, Channel 5, Scottish, Ulster, Sky News, and even GB News are tied into aspects of our PSB, impartiality and other uh, systems. Um, the system is there to try and ensure fairness and impartiality, but it's uniquely British. I mean, I've lived in America for five years. You can never have anything like we have here. I mean, it covers commitments to children's content, to art, religion, drama and entertainment. Um, there are provisions around the minimum number of originated new hours that a channel can show, uh, guaranteed access to sports events. Um, it, you know, we have a lot of work in our PSP ecosystem about making programmes outside of the M25 corridor and equally pressure on reflecting the UK back to itself, as well as reflecting the UK internationally, both through things like the World Service, but also through programme sales, which export British culture through shows all around the world. So we have a quite complex, quite unique ecosystem, and that's where things like this channel for privatisation matter because they upset the ecosystem in unpredictable ways. And then when you look at the role of the BBC in this, I remember when I was hovering over joining the BBC or taking or staying with a job at Channel 4, and Peter Salmon came to me and he said, look, I understand why you had been turned by the Channel 4 thing. He says, what you have to understand is we're in a universe and the BBC is the sun. Everything in this PSB universe rotates around the BBC. And it's true, the BBC sits at the centre of that PSB ecosystem. It sits at the centre in terms of standards, uh, it, well, in terms of competition for standards, competition for staff, in terms of training, in terms of new ways of doing things. And it isn't just in terms of news and current affairs, it's also in terms of drama and comedy and entertainment. It's also, I mean, to take the, the Netflix comparison that the Secretary of State so beloved, I mean, one, you don't see Netflix in um, Ukraine, but you also don't see them in Bogna Regis, uh, um, you know, Slandudno or, uh, or Kakaldi. You know, the BBC provides a global to local TV, radio, online ecosystem of its own, which is unique and highly valued. And Mark has talked about, um, you know, how much people use it. People use it far more than they realise they use it. There was a really interesting study where they took the BBC off a group of people, a, a group of sort of BBC um, deniers. People said they never used it. So they took it off them, stopped them from using it, and then they realised how much they used it and missed it. Um, and to go all the way back to the point David made at the beginning, now in this age of social media and misinformation and disinformation, the BBC sits at the centre of a whole network of trusted providers that matter you know facts matter and mark and i have sat through bbc meetings where we have beaten ourselves up over what other people might say might be the smallest transgressions but the bbc still holds itself to a really really high level and bar of accountability around impartiality and around getting it right and you know i've worked at itv and channel 4 and in the states nothing there is, there is nothing I've experienced like that. Internal rigor, internal discipline, internal desire to do well, driven by this idea that everyone pays for us, everyone expects to be, you know, to be properly seen, reflected, heard, understood through the BBC. Sure, we made mistakes. I made mistakes. Mark made mistakes. You're always going to make mistakes. But if the only organisation in the world I've worked at where you make a mistake and the public have a right, to expect you to sort of deal with it. You know, you would look for letters to come in about your program. You would, and if letters came in, you were expected to answer them. And you don't get that kind of accountability in any other sort of broadcasting system that I've ever worked at. And I've worked at all of the ones in the UK, apart from Sky and GB News. Thank you, Pat. Can I 
I mean, can, can I just ask you, you know, when you're making, how does it make a difference when you're setting out to make a program? I don't know, you know, for some, some, you know, when you're setting out to make a, a series of programs for any demographic you want to choose, but that, that's going to be comedy. I'm thinking actually, I'm thinking of the Steve McQueen uh, films, which were quite audacious to put out. What goes through a sort of BBC head? It, it's, everybody wants it to be successful, but they also want what? Well, I think if you, if you take the Steve McQueen films, which I are agree. in part within the BBC a response to failures around racial yeah. diversity, then within the BBC, and I know how much they will have beaten themselves up over doing it, and when they decided to do it, they will want an Oscar director to direct these films. They're going to put these films... I mean, those Steve McQueen films, if I'm being honest, they were sort of... In tone, they were BBC Two films. <laughs> but the BBC made a statement to put these films on BBC One. Right? They got the sort of ratings that in a commercial broadcaster you'd be taken out and shot for because they weren't massive rating success. But the BBC put them on BBC One to make a statement, which is these films matter. This is our biggest channel. This is where we put our biggest shows. And even if this doesn't get a massive live audience, this is the showcase for these films. And that is a massive statement, which the BBC will always make. There is an inherent desire to do the right thing. They may not always get it right, but there is an inherent desire to do the right thing, to right the wrong, and then to try and go beyond maybe what's been done before. Th thank you ever so much. I just like you all, perhaps to just to reflect on. You know, you know, we've got. A, it's been a wonderful story of the BBC. Uh, it's a real sort of set of testaments. Why, 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 why does it feel so um, cowed sometimes? Or am I wrong? That's. I mean, uh, that's. It well. sometimes it feels. Oh. I have a brief go if I might. I mean, I'm, forgive yeah. me if, if anybody's heard me say this before, but you know, the BBC oscillates between projecting itself and being perceived as imperially arrogant and having a nervous breakdown. Um, and sometimes, <laughs> you know, there's no synchromesh between these two positions. Um, and uh, of course, you feel the weight and the responsibility. And in many ways, it's a good thing too. But of course, if you feel it in the wrong way, it becomes. Uh, inhibiting. And then there's a crisis of perception. I remember um, after Hutton, um, it was 2004, I mean, it's extremely dreadful, the loss of a director general popular uh, and the loss of a, a, you know, an extremely uh, good chair in Gavin Davis in terms of complete understanding of what the BBC was about. And the, the place was having a nervous breakdown. And then you made an editorial decision and people could only see the editorial decision refracted back through the lens of the latest crisis. You've bottled it they would say, because of Hutton and because of the criticism. And you try to persuade yourself um, that you were doing it for the right reasons and you were doing it evidence-led, but always with the BBC, there's a danger that it's so big and so much in the news and so commented on that people perceive it as being the victim of self-censorship and not being able sufficiently to resist pressure. Um, I mean, I fight back against it. I mean, I know that individual decisions are made which sometimes look as if they're not courageous, sometimes may not even be courageous. But I don't think that the BBC, uh, in the way that it makes its programmes and decisions, is perpetually uh, doing it because it feels beaten up and has to cow to whatever the government of the day is or whatever the mean average newspaper criticism will be. I think it's better than that. It was, and I think it still is. Thank you. Can, no. I, can, can I just um, yeah, no, come no. in there? Yes, just thought, I mean, when you, when you do look at the whole history of the BBC, one of the things that strikes you when you're immersed in its, in its written archives is the constant worrying. The, 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 I mean, a lot of people say there's far too much talking in the BBC, but the talking, in a sense, is, is where the quality resides. It's part of, of, of what, what you mentioned, that rigour that constant worrying, are we getting it right? 
I mean, I, the only thing I'd say is that I think in terms of impartiality, um, which I think is such a tricky thing to kind of, you know, to, to, to keep hold of, I think the one area that perhaps the BBC needs to worry about a little bit more is, is what Peter Oborn has, has, has written about. I mean, he's, he's written about what he calls a moral emergency. Yeah. In other words, that we do appear to be uh, in a situation where, you know, traditionally, you know, the BBC has been impartial between different points of view, but how do you do that when it's clear that some of those views are not necessarily being articulated in good faith? In other words, sometimes it's lies and it's deliberately lying. How do you deal with that, I think, is something which the BBC has still not necessarily got a complete answer to. Perhaps there isn't an answer to it, but it, it feels as if the BBC has to catch up with a changing political atmosphere in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Janelle, Janelle. Yeah, I think, um, it, like David just said, you know, I think a lot of audiences are very, or audiences or younger people are increasingly values driven. So they do see everything through the lens of their values, whether their values are the correct ones or the right ones to have, but they see things through their values. And when they don't see their values reflected back to them, they see that as a, a bias or, or, or something that's wrong and, and, and are quite indignant. I think we just have an increasingly vocal audience like someone said earlier you know people would write to you before letters take time they take effort the, the, the strongest the most caring people get in touch now anyone can get in touch so of course I think as, as that happens people do feel more nervous because it's almost an avalanche of feedback coming at you all the time constantly about everything Pat. also I think as the BBC I mean I think part of the solution to this for the BBC is to become more diverse and to better reflect the audiences that it serves. Uh, and I don't just mean that in party political senses, because one of the funny things about all of these bleat, bleating on about anti-Tory bias is the number of prominent Tories who worked for the BBC and still work for the BBC. Um, but I do think that if they had a greater range of racial, social, sexuality, diversity within the BBC, especially at the upper levels, the complexity of those debates would would take would feed into the rigor that goes into some of the conversations that would weed some of these things out at an earlier stage, and people would feel more confident about them. I do feel sometimes when they misstep, it's because culturally they're not quite sure of the ground that they're on um, in a pretty unforgiving, you know, I, I hate the phrase cancel culture, but. Yeah, the pylon on social media comes pretty quickly um, and it can be quite unnerving. So I, I do think that better reflecting the audience that they serve will help them, will give them more confidence. But it's there's a transition you have to go through to get there and they're, they're part way through it. I'd, I'd say on that, um, a bit of history here, that Channel 4 got the territory of racial diversity in the UK early and very well. Uh, both in terms of programming, so they were substance, and in terms of marketing, and the two were connected. It's not. Can, really I, just, yeah. can I just ask something? I mean, we treated most of the crises as if they were kind of, you know, people languishing. I mean, you know, Savile, um, the Lady Diana interview. These, these. But I remember, I, I remember when somebody phoned me when somebody Jenny Abramsky phoned me up about Savile, and. I, you know, it felt to me like the first crisis I'd seen in which it was the BBC versus the public, actually. So that they haven't all, they haven't all been, they haven't, they may have been anguishing, but not always the right, you know, Netflix is about to make a program about Marion, about the people that exposed Savile, really, and they're cutting out Liz. But I mean, you know, the BBC treated the two people who'd revealed that story best, just appallingly. So there were, I mean, it's, it, yeah. you know, the anguish, the, ang <laughs> the anger, yeah, okay. I mean, ang you know, the anguish isn't always spent in the right places. Perhaps. Pastor is a multi-headed hydra, but Mark was, um... Well, um, um, for better or worse, I, I was in between having left the BBC the first time and rejoined it the second. I mean, I know a lot of the characters and yeah. however you look at it, um, it was, uh, a, a monumental stain on the BBC, and I mean Savile's paedophilia before we go any further. Um, and 
um, you know, George Entwistle, uh, the, the least likely person to be guilty of any moral crime in his personal behaviour, mm. ends up losing his job over the mishandling of the journalism unit. And whatever, and actually Pat probably does know more than I do about it, but whatever, clearly the journalism was mishandled and uh, a terrible price was paid for by the BBC in terms of public trust. And quite understandably so. The BBC then went through a period of you know, profound self-examination and external invigilation, which has produced a current set of guidelines. And we'll see where that gets us to, but I have no reason to believe that they weren't put in with good faith and aren't having had some kind of an effect. Yeah, compare that to other environments at the moment where, um, <laughs> where you, you, you could have had a third party investigation and a report. I mean, that's the thing about the BBC, people resign, people lose their jobs if they get this stuff wrong and you lose the faith of the public the bbc is is very quick that um you know deputy heads roll but heads roll as well at the bbc and then the bbc uniquely comes in and invites i mean uh, on um Sab, it was nick pollard wasn't it from sky to come in and just lay the organization bare to the world i mean that is a unique yeah bbc cleansing process and i think it's a it, it's it's worth um, pointing out that a lot of the documentation of these episodes in history, these recent <laughs> episodes in history, is there online. I mean, mm. you want to find out about Savile, you go to the BBC and you can download Dame Janet Smith's report. You can download mm. Nick Pollard's report into what went wrong with the journalism at the time and so on. So there, it, it, it's sort of this accountability is uh, really very, very striking again yeah. compared with other uh, broadcasting institutions we've we've got some questions in um, and i wanted to just uh, people dive in we've got one from jamie medhurst in aberystwyth um uh, and he he asks which is another i think either a wonderful opportunity and or a can of worms it's a complicated issue you know given that the bbc is being british as it were how does it reflect and how should it reflect better uh and how is it going to relate to increasingly devolved nations? Wales is feeling very positive about the BBC. So is Scotland, but what does that do at the centre? So how, what, you know, that, that other tension, Jamie, who's a brilliant uh, media historian uh, himself, no, how do we I mean, deal with that? How does the BBC deal with that? So I'm, I'm a non-exec at Cardiff Productions based in, in Wales, not so much da, Jamie. Um, I, I think what the B, I mean, so obviously you have BBC Wales, BBC Scotland, BBC Northern Ireland. What the BBC has started to do is take those programmes which they were uniquely broadcasting within the nation and broadcasting them on the network. And they need actually to do more of that. In fact, they could go further and let the nation's commissioning teams commission things directly into network television. At the moment, they have a dual tick system where somebody in the centre and somebody in the nation's but a really confident way of doing it will be safe to the nation, right, Wales, you've got eight weeks, BBC two, eight o'clock, off you go. Um, that way, because what wasn't happening, is you weren't seeing the nations reflected back into the rest of the UK. So that is one change. That they're, they're on that path. They started to do it, but they need to, in my book, they need to go further and they need to be bolder and they need to simplify. That, that, that's really interesting and practical. Anybody? I mean, there, it does pose problems for what is the BBC? I mean, Britishness feels to me a very problematic thing at the moment. Anybody? Janelle, you're smiling. <laughs> no, no, I'm smiling because I'm smiling at the fact that it is a problematic thing. But, you know, as Pat just said and alluded to, it, it is about reflecting everybody back to themselves and not just in their silos. So we'll reflect you back to yourself over here. But in the mainstream, we'll only re reflect back what we think is mainstream and interesting. So I think it is about, like you say, like with the Steve McQueen films, putting them on BBC One, making them accessible to all. It, some people won't want to watch, but some people will watch and then they'll be enlightened and they'll have a new view of the BBC. But I, I do think for me, one of the one of the biggest sea changes will be true diversity in leadership. You know, the other day a report came out, there's in journalism ac across the piece, and I'm just using journalism, that's why it was my space, but there's 45% women in terms of the field of journalism, but in leadership, that falls to 28%. So we do need more 
reflective um, leadership teams because they make more reflective decisions. When I make a decision about what I think a white woman or a black man might like, not that we're homogenous groups because no one is a monolith, but my understanding is much less. And so when we have um, more women, women's stories are reflected better. When we have more people of color, their stories are reflected better. You know, in all of my time working in different newsrooms, I never really came across many Eastern Europeans working in newsrooms. I never really came across um, many people from different kinds of old Chinese people working in, in, in newsrooms. It was tend to be the same kind of racial groups, although some of them much smaller, and that comes across in how we tell stories. It comes across in who we decide to face our stories. So black people get to face stories about black people. But, you know, black people go to the dentist too. They have a doctor, they have a GP. So how do we make that story multifaceted? We have everyone at the decision making table and that makes a massive difference. I'm, I'm, I'm prompted to think that um, just after the Second World War, almost the entire BBC was Eastern Europe, but they were just called things like Mike. <laughs> I mean, uh, or, 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 or George, uh, thinking of George Fisher. Anyway, there, were, there was a moment when the BBC was basically Eastern Europe. That's basically what it was. Um, th thank you very much. Any other? I mean, I think there are real problems about, you know, that, 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 the, that the nations are pulling, you know, Mark Drayford is the hero of Wales um, and Nicola Sturgeon is the heroine of Scotland. Um, oh. I just, just, just something to add here that, I mean, throughout the BBC's history, you get a sense in which the BBC, I mean, the, the BBC has a sort of internal contradiction in that it, it's attracted to the idea of, as it were, nation building and consensus and sort of unity and so on. It doesn't, it, I mean, you can see some of this discussion very early on in the 1920s. And if you think about, for instance, Reith, and the Committee for Spoken English, which, which imposes, if you like, a kind of standardized Southern English as a sort of a both of, in terms of pronunciation and accent and so on, a kind of um, bulldozing over, you know, regional accents and so on. But Reith's justification was a kind of equality of access. In other words, in, in his mind, it was, well, we, we, we need to make sure that no one is disadvantaged and everyone would be able to get on, get a job in, in, at the end of the 20s and the early 30s. This was important if they could speak properly. And of course, there was a very clear definition as far as he was concerned about what speaking properly was. But, but you know, this, this, this sense in which the BBC sometimes papers over differences and you can see this actually, you know, in the 1950s with its, some of its coverage um, and some of its thinking about programmes for immigrants. It was about assimilation, right? It, yeah. it, was, it was about how do we make you more British and, and on sort of pre-existing terms of what that meant. It wasn't, it was uncomfortable with the idea of cultural difference. And so the BBC, in a sense, has always been, you know, at that stage, it was it was a slow starter with grappling with difference. I'll just say in 1994, yep. I was a reporter for BBC News from South East and I got put into elocution lessons. So that, that thing didn't die out. It didn't work. It didn't work, thankfully. But um, <laughs> that was the, that was, so it was still around in the 90s. Um, Claude Green has asked a slightly pickier question, I think, really interesting. Does it matter that the BBC is leeching talent? That's what he's really asking, you know. So Paul, I, Mayor, Emily yeah. Motelis, um, Eddie Mayor, you know, Andrew Marr, but it, it, it's pretty, it's pretty big. Yeah. Right? Does it matter that yeah. the BBC is leeching talent? Let me have a go at that. Uh, um, yes. Yeah, I mean, virtually all of those names. Um, <laughs> people I know and I admire a great deal, but um, the BBC, uh, above all, uh, is a talent organisation. Yeah. I mean, it has these other attributes, it's owned by all of us, it's accountable to all of us, it's powerful, it's big, it's all of this sort of stuff, but the BBC is talent or nothing. Uh, it will be able to survive off its brand history for a while, but in the end, if it doesn't get um, a host of extremely good people, and now comes a, a tricky bit of the argument, very often to work at a discount, uh, not always, um, but if you can't get those people, then the alchemy goes. 
Uh, and that may be the biggest threat of all that comes out of something we've not talked about and is very often talked about, which is the squeeze in real-term funding on the BBC, so 30% over the last 10 years. So the BBC should not pay and pretty well never does pay uh, the same as most of its broadcasting competitors for its senior talent. Um, and uh, of course, its disclosure uh, requirements are different to the disclosure requirements of uh, ITV and Sky and GB News for all that matter. Um, and Gary Lineker earns a lot of money and Gary Lineker is seriously good. Uh, and Gary Lineker, if you probably, I don't know his BT paycheck and it's none of my business, but I suspect that per hour he gets paid a heck of a lot less for doing the stuff that he does on the BBC. Uh, and some of these people have gone because they require new challenges in their life. Um, Andrew Marr would be a rather good example, obviously an absolutely completely phenomenal broadcaster. Uh, and some of these people may have gone either because of that and because they're getting quite a lot more money. Uh, and these are people who are admirable, who have done 15, 20, 25 years for the BBC, but who in the final analysis get more elsewhere. The public resents it, the politicians capitalise on the resentment and multiply it. Um, and from time to time, the BBC makes mistakes. Jonathan Ross pays too much. It was a bad contract, shouldn't have happened because it was way out of line with whatever rational explanation could be made to the public about it. But on the whole, the BBC is not top dollar payer for its talent. And then we come to the behind the scenes talent. The BBC has to have enough of a spectrum of creative possibilities for people like well, all the people here uh, and it's 25 year olds who walk in from whatever background they are to want to do their best stuff for the BBC because they're working with other people who do their best stuff for the BBC and talent begets talent. And what really worries me about the funding squeeze um, is that fewer talented people will feel that they can afford to or want to come to the BBC, not only because they're getting paid, not as much as they might do elsewhere, but because they're just not enough creative possibilities. Uh, and that's death by strangulation um, and slow asphyxiation. And I really, really resent it. Can I just a very, very quick, there's another question that's come in. Just very quick. I mean, you know, what's going to happen? You know, the, the, we haven't talked about the funding. The BBC has been absolutely slaughtered on the funding, you know, and we'll, as we go forward, is going to be more slaughtered because of inflation. What's going to happen to the orchestras? Very quick answer. Does, is that the end of the BBC orchestras? Well, Should how many plans have there been? I mean, I David, <laughs> how many plans have there been? How many different headlines have we lived through where the BBC, somebody in the BBC comes up with an idea of yeah. snacking an orchestra? Yeah. Um, suddenly, the whole of Northern Ireland, stroke Wales, stroke the BBC, uh, the symphony okay. orchestra, right? yeah, it goes, it, it's very, very hard thing to do, but there comes a point where it's just going to have to happen. And if the funding squeeze continues, I, I, you know, I don't know how many things can be made to be sacrosanct to the BBC, not everything. No, I, 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 I think we've got to sort of finalise that. You can't have everything and not pay for it, even though the BBC is the major source of funding around... And, and even so, actually, size, yeah. size matters, actually. The, the, the capacity matters. of the BBC to kind of invest the reservoir of talent, the cultural capital it can kind of contain, the, its ability to take the long-term view rather than short-term gain. Uh, you know, these are all things that at various points in history have come together. D-Day, you know, the, the pulling together of engineering talent, reporting talent, presenting talent, managerial talent, and so on. You, you know, the capacity to report extensively in Ukraine, the capacity to actually create BBC Online. These have come through size, right? Yeah. The heft of the BBC in a very literal sense. So a small BBC is not just about it sort of, as it were, disappearing and moving to the margins. It's a, it's a fundamental threat to its ability to do big, great things that cost money. Well, Peter Oborn has a rather trenchant video out on social media at the moment. One of the things he talks about with the current administration in Downing Street is the attack on institutions. Yeah. And the BBC is one of those great institutions which has institutional value. Yes. And the diminishment of the institution is the thing we should be worried about. I think I'm going to have to wrap up there. I, I think that's that would have been another fascinating discussion. The fact that the best resistance to authoritarian anything is well-made people. And well-made people have to have pleasure and delight and joy. 
And the BBC has always kind of understood joy at its best, um, as well as the facts, you know, joy and facts is back, uh, as it were, bread and roses. Um, so I'd like to thank our absolutely spectacularly interesting team. We could have gone on um, for their time. I'd like to thank the audience for coming. I'd like to remind you that the news exhibition will startle you. It's got 16th century witches beside extraordinary modern things and an amazing oral stuff. It's a really good thing for a grandchild's half term. Can I, uh, um, it, I couldn't, couldn't recommend, and you can have good ice cream in the front. I'd like to thank the British Library, um, in itself the place where so many of us have thought so many of the, th the th you know, we thought the thoughts that make thinking exciting. Um, and I'd like to thank um, our panel again for a really interesting discussion. And I think we have to, it behoves us all to do something to support as well as criticize and develop an institution. So it's there to be, to stand on our side, not anybody else's side for the next century. So thank you all very much for a wonderful discussion. And thank you, the audience and good night.